بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and thank you very much for hosting me in this beloved place which I have not been in for many years and after many many years of interruption we resume the Arab Light Ta'ala the study of Al-Mafnawi Al-Arab Al-Nuri which is the collection of Arabic writings authored in Arabic in the original by Ustad Badi'i Zaman Al-Nursi Rahmatullahi Alayhi Ala Ruhi Al-Fatiha We had recorded something like 10 sessions that are already on YouTube and after almost a decade of interruption, we resume, inshallah, reading. But this time, I will not read in sequence. I will choose some passages and try to explicate them and then go back to reading in, in sequence. And I will focus on passages that are of a methodological nature, meaning passages that can give us some guidance on how to read. The Rasail al and how to read the Matnawi al Arab al Because the Shaykh Rahmatullah Ali, Ustad Bidir Zaman Nursi, actually tells us about how to read his writings and also even tells us about the difficulties of reading his writings. He predicted and could foresee the difficulties we will have and he explained why we are having difficulties. And I think it's very important to be aware of these passages because they can help us in multiple ways. They can help us to improve our way of reading. They can also encourage us when we feel discouraged and overwhelmed by the difficulties that we are facing. Yaqul al-Shaykh Rahmatullah Alayhi, he says on page 222 of the Matnawi al-Arab al-Nuri and I'm using the Suzlair printing. Alhamdulillah, now there are Indian printings and uh, Mecca printings and Alhamdulillah, which is really great. I'm using the Suzlair Egyptian printing, page 222. And the original Arabic says, if, uh, if you have Turkish copies, for those who would like to also have the Turkish copies so they can follow, that might help them more as well. So on page 222, I will read the Arabic and then translate slowly, inshallah. إفادة المرام meaning disclosure of what is intended of what it is that we want to do إعلم and whenever you see إعلم in the متنب العربي نوري as Ustad says in another place you have to understand that إعلم actually is a a word that alerts you and tells you there is very dense importance at this point at one point in the Matna al Arabi Nuri, he says, whenever you see I'lam, understand that a whole risala can be written just about that point. So when he says I'lam, do pay attention. It is in English, know that. Okay. يقولون, it has been said to me that people are saying, لا نفهم كثيرا مما في آثاره. We don't understand many of what is written in his legacy, in what he writes. فَتَصِيرُ ضَائِعَةً And it will be lost. Why? Because people are not able to understand what the Ustad is saying. So he's been told by some of his students and the people he knows that people are saying we don't understand what the Ustad is writing. And because we don't understand, it will be lost. فأقول, and I say in response to this claim لا تضيع بإذنه تعالى it will not be lost with God's permission with the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal it will not be lost بإذنه and the notion of إذن or permission divine permission is a central notion in the Rasail al you'll find it all over the Rasail al Nothing happens except through the idhan 
of Allah Azza wa Jal. Nothing happens. So that the whole universe has to be permitted. Everything that happens in the, in the universe has to be permitted to happen. Otherwise, it would not happen. And the difference between people who know that everything that happens is bi'idnihi, with the permission of the Lord, and people who think that things happen because of their inherent natures, is the difference between Iman and Kufr. It's very, very important. This is why I will explain that. If you believe that things happen because of inherent nature of things, without any divine intervention, without any divine will, then you, you run into kufriyat. You, 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 why? Because you don't see the role of the creator of the things that you see before you. So it is a, you, you're seeing it as ma'na ismi rather than ma'na harfi. We'll come to that. And this is very important. So al-qawl bi tabai' is an Arabic term, which is like to believe in natures, in inherent natures, was something that the Ash'ari school and the Maturidi school and the Ahlul Hadith all agreed at ijma' or consensus that it is actually kufr to al-qawl bi tabai' to say that things are happening just because of nature. Okay, so. Now, unfortunately, even in children's books and on TV and so on, Mother Nature does this and Mother Nature does that. Allah Azza wa Jal does things. It's not Mother Nature. Okay? So, uh, the difference between, the, the, uh, between someone who believes that things happen just by themselves and someone who believes that they happen through God's permission, through divine permission, through Allah's permission, is a big difference. So he says, لا تضيعوا this is not just in passing. So the, he actually means it, bi'idnihi. And you'll find it all over the, the Rasail al -Nur. So pay attention to this word whenever it comes. فأقولوا, so he says, I say, لا تضيعوا بإذنه تعالى. It will not my words, what I write, these athar. He says, and notion, notice he knows, uses the word athar. Athar. Athar is like a trace. Okay? So if somebody is walking on the beach, what he leaves behind him are his athar. Mm -hmm. And this is why, like, when the scouts follow the traces, they say, iqtifa'ul athar, to, to go after the traces, okay? So he calls his writings athar, because they are things that he leaves behind, okay? This is very important, that when you're reading the rasail, you have to understand that they are like, the footprints that are on the beach. These athar are not the walking itself. They are indicators of the walking. They are what the Ustad left behind to point to what he had to go through. So these that you're seeing are his traces, the traces of his entire activity on earth okay, as, as he was living, and the traces of his life and his mushahadat, what he saw as he was walking. So the Rasail al-Nur can best point to the living praxis or practice of the Ustad as he lived his life. And so he's very precise in, in his use of language. So he didn't say, لا نفهم كثيرا من كتاباته, his writings. He did not say, لا نفهم كثيرا من كلامه, his speech. He said, من آثاره, which is very interesting. فأقول, لا تضيع بإذنه تعالى. وَسَيَجِئُ زَمَانُ And there will come a time يَفْهَمُهَا Who will understand this? It will be understood by أَكْثَرُ الْمُتَفَكِّرِينَ الْمُتَدَيِّنِينَ Most thinking believers. So they have to be متدينين having faith but also متفكرين have thinking. So he thinks that المتدينين المتفكرين thinking believing individuals will understand. There will come a time when they will understand Rasail al-Nur. فأقول لا تضيع بإذنه تعالى وسيجيء زمان يفهمها أكثر متفكرين المتدينين إن شاء من بيده مقاليد كل شيء. If it is willed by him who is handling the entire controls of everything. المقاليد are those elements that control things so meaning Allah Azza wa Jal so if Allah wills 
there will come believers who are thinkers who will understand the Rasail al-Nur and the writings and the athar, the traces that are left behind by Ustad Badi'a Zaman Nursi. I will, as I explain, I reread so that you get familiar with the passage in, in completeness. So even if you know a little Arabic, it's, it's important that some of the terminology sticks with you because it's also in the Ottoman. And also, it will help you with the etymologies of, of the words as you as you encounter. So, ifadat al mara, i'lam annahu qila, i'lam annahu qila li inna nas yaqulun la nafham kathira mimma fi atharih fatasiru daya. Know that people are saying, uh, or some are saying, or it has been told to me that people are saying, we don't understand many of the traces. Okay, his writings, his, his traces, and it, they will be lost. And he says, It will not be lost with God's permission or Allah's permission. And there will come a time where most thinking believers will understand them with Allah's permission. Most of these masail, these issues, Mas'ala is like problematic, okay? And the mas'ala from sa'ala, su'ala, to ask a question. So, al-masail are not just um, problems. It, it means issues, it yeah. means challenges, it means problematics, it means uh, puzzlements, all of these are masail. Id aktharu hadhi al-masail adwiyatun. Most of them are medicines. And we are so happy we have a pharmacologist with us. If Akhtar Hadi Masail, Adwiyatun, most of these topics, issues that we discuss are actually Adwiyatun. They are actually medicines. Jarrabtuha fi nafsi, which I experimented with on myself. Okay? I tried these medicines on myself. A'taniha al Furqan al Hakim. Where did I get these medicines? From which pharmacy did I get it? I get them, I got them from the Quran al-Hakim, the wise Quran. Lakin, lakin, but yumkin an la yafhamuha al-nas kama afhamuha bi tamamiha li anna nafsi bisu ikhtiyariha min al-ra'si ila al-qadam mulamma'atun bil-juruh al-mutanawira. Maybe people will not understand these issues as I understand them, because in my case, because of my bad choices in life, okay, I am from my head to my toe full of injuries and wounds of various types. So because I am ill, I am injured, I am um, wounded, I can understand these medicines in ways that someone who is not wounded like me or injured like me would not understand them in the same way. Okay. Notice the principle he's talking about here. Yes. He's basically telling you that you would not appreciate the medicine if you have not suffered the ailment. So why is he saying that there will come a time when most thinking believers will understand him? It's because he knows that these injuries which he felt back in the early 20th century are going to be very common today in the future. Okay? So today, Ilhad, unfortunately, atheism is spreading like wildfire. So the Ilhad which he encountered in the early 20th century in a secluded part of the Muslim Ummah is now spreading even in many places like the Arab world, in Indonesia, Malaysia. So he's saying that people who have these injuries or similar injury, injuries will understand these medicines and they will understand the value of this medicine. If you've never suffered a migraine, you would not, you would not understand the value of a migraine medicine. If you've, if you've, never, if you've never suffered back pain, you would not understand the, the value of a, a Voltarine uh, sachet, for example, or, a, or a, an injection 
of, of cortisone, for example. Okay? But you would understand it if you, if you have suffered this. He's basically saying that because the, what he is receiving from the Quran is therapeutic and medicinal, it is only the injured and people in need of, of the healing would understand the meaning of this healing. Okay? So part of the difficulties of understanding the Rasail al-Nur, he's saying, is that people have different existential conditions. People who have not suffered from certain ailments would find certain medicines pointless. They don't mean anything for them. Notice the how what you call diqqa in Arabic. Diqqa, you say, uh, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the very, very specific and very accurate. So he's saying people would not understand what I'm saying in completeness because my own nafs through its bad choices from head to toe has suffered from these injuries of various types فَالسَّلِيمُ بِحَيَاتِ الْقَلْبِ He who is sane or he who is healthy in his heart لا يفهم درجة تأثير التريق في السقيم He cannot understand the efficacy of the antidote that is needed by the ill who has been bitten by a snake, the snake of al-hawa, of desire, kama yafhamuhu, as the one who has been bitten would understand. Okay. What snakes is he talking about? It is, he's talking about the snakes of materialism the snakes of atheism, the snakes of tacit disbelief that is put and sweetened as science, for example, or falsafa. He talks about falsafa also in this way. But what he means by falsafa, Ustad, is, is very similar to what Imam Ghazali would, would understand as falsafa, meaning naturalistic philosophy. Because there are other places where, of course, he praises thinking and another and so on. And that kind of falsafa, of course, is praiseworthy. So, for example, when we study science today, you go to any physics class from elementary to high school to university, and you're told that there are certain laws of physics. One of the laws of physics, which you memorize, and it's called like that, like a law of physics, okay? Is that matter cannot be created from nothing, nor can it be obliterated. It can be converted to other matter, it can be converted to energy, but it can never be obliterated. And it cannot be created what's called ex nihilo, meaning out of nothing. And this is studied in physics as a basic fundamental law. So before you do the details of Newton's mechanics, you, you have to understand this law and you have to believe it. But notice, what are we saying in this law? We're, basic say we're basically saying that the world is eternal, like the old philosophers used to say, and that it will last forever and it was not created by anybody. Why? Because it cannot be created from nothing. While in Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah teach us, what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us, is that matter is created and is annihilated by Allah Azza wa And that it is only sustained in existence through the qayyumiyya or the sustenance of its creator. So notice how this kufri notion is put in the form of scientific truth okay this is one you come to biology and again you're taught in the science books that things develop from things through natural selection okay and it's taught as science it's fact 
And if you argue, they tell you, here is the fossil evidence. He, these are the facts. How can you deny this? Inherent in this idea is that there is no need for a willful creator who through his knowledge, creativity, and, and uh, sheer will creates the world. And you find silly authors like this British philosopher, uh, he wrote a book called The Blind Watchmaker, in which he uses the examples of algorithms from what's called artificial life to demonstrate that you can have complex forms, as in complexity theory and theory of automata, that you can have all these forms without having a creator. Okay? So he says the universe similarly can just pop up like this in the way these algorithms work without a creator. But this silly philosopher does, never asks the question, okay, these algorithms are wonderful and they develop great things at the fan, at Santa Fe Institute and the MIT Media Lab and all these places, but who wrote the algorithm? Have you ever seen an algorithm spontaneously generate by itself? And even if artificial life now is able to create algorithms, it is because of the algorithms in which they were written. So it is possible to have an algorithm creating algorithms, but who wrote the original algorithm? So, so long as there is an orderly set of instructions, and an algorithm is only simply a set of instructions, it's a set of rules, it is like a cookbook. You do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and then, so it's a sequence that you start. You say run to the program and it runs. But who wrote the program? So, again, in biology, you have this, these kufriyat bundled together in, a, in, a, in a, an innocent looking scientific theory. In chemistry, they also teach you that uranium has these properties and water has these properties and nitrogen has these properties and they have these properties inherent in them. And when you put uh, sulfuric acid with a, with a sodium salt, you're gonna get hydrochloric acid and uh, water, you know? So, and it sounds like these taba'i' are actually doing all this stuff, okay? By themselves, without need for a creator. Again, the, if I go to these molecules and I analyze them, say even a simple molecule like hydrogen, okay? I'll find protons and neutrons and in, the, in, the, in the middle and they find electrons buzzing around with certain probabilities. And then I go to the subatomic particle, I find neutrinos and quanta and yes, but who put all this together? This clockwork that is working, this, this orderly universe. The creator who created all this is behind all of this chemistry. You cannot simply teach the chemistry as if God does not exist. So the Sheikh is saying there are snakes that bite us. And these snakes are notions and ideas that actually put the poison of kufr very, in a very tricky way. And he's saying someone who has not been bitten by atheistic ideas and by materialistic ideas and by this arrogance of what he calls false civilization, al madaniya zaifa he says, would not understand why you need these rasail al-nur and why you need all this talk about the, the medicines from the Quran. So he's saying the injured appreciate the medicine. Okay? This is all in one small paragraph. Okay? We go to the paragraph after that. He says, وَأَيْضًا إِنِّي لَا أَتَصَرَّفُ فِي السَّانِحَاتِ بِالتَّوْبِيحِ Also, he says, whatever passes through the mind, I will, I will tell you about the etymology of sanihat. Whatever passes through the mind, I do, I do not try to manipulate it in order to explain. What is sanaha, sanihat? These are things that pass through, okay? Supposing I'm sitting here and there is a little fly and it goes through my, my, my viewing field, okay? It is passing through. Notice your mind, your soul, your ana, your, 
you know, you are never empty headed. You are never so spaced out that there isn't anything passing through. You are always thinking something. Even if I try to not think, I am thinking about not thinking. Even I try to think of nothing, that's something. Okay? So, sanihat are the thoughts. Okay? So as he is looking at the universe, looking at the trees and the stones and the animals and the droplets, and if you look at the Rasail Nur, it's incredible how observant he is. He's looking at the light, how it reflects in the droplet of the rain on the edge of the piece of wood. He is looking at the eye of the fly. He's looking at the leg of the mosquito, the, the wing of the, of the bee. He is, he is very observant, okay? And as he is looking at the world, ideas come to him. So these are sanihat. They, they, they just happen to come like that. What the sheikh does, what the ustad does, he writes them. Okay? And he says, I don't make it my business to actually manipulate this. I only record what I see. To put it in philosophical terms, he has what's called the phenomenological method. You study the phenomena and you record what you see. As Edmund Husserl say, says, to the things themselves. Let us look at the things themselves. Except this is phenomenology plus plus. It's a much more profound uh, phenomenology. Not only this, he is very empirical. He is very much like a biologist or like a geologist who's looking at these stones and crystals and looks at the difference between the two. Oh, and this has calcium and this has magnesium and this is very dark and this is very... So he has that kind of attitude. Okay? But he's an empiricist of a wider kind. What does that mean? The word empirical by the 19th century became like a name of, a, of a, a, an approach in philosophy, a kind of an experimental, scientific or scientistic approach. But it comes from the Greek and the empiricus in Latin was the doctor, the physician. So the famous skeptical doctor Sextus Empiricus is, is, the, is, the, is, a, is a doctor, is a, is a physician. So now we say someone is following the empirical method so he's looking empirically at things, observing what there is. But notice, the range of what you see, the domain that you see, can be small and can be very wide. We think that we're such great beings that we see many things. But if there is a cat here, it would be seeing things that we cannot see. And if there is a fly, it will be seeing things that we cannot see. Because we see in what's called in physics, the range of invisible light. Uh, sorry, of uh, visible light, of visible light. Anything under red, we cannot see. Anything above violet, we, can, uh, we cannot see. So when, we, when in the army, they wear these infrared goggles, they can see things in the dark. And if you have devices that can do ultraviolet, you can see certain other things. Mm -hmm. That means what you see depends on the spectrum that is allowed to you. So if you are an empiricist and you're making observations, it's possible to be a very narrow-minded empiricist and look at tables and chairs and material things. But it's also possible that you, you also look at spiritual things and that you, you look at things of the heart and that you, you look at things of the emotion. And that when you're watching, you're not just watching trees and cups and trees, but you're watching emotions of anger as they came on, come into you and leave you. Emotions of love, emotions of mercy, emotions of pity, um, emotions of compassion, emotions of hatred. You can actually take an observational stance and watch the hatred you have for your enemy and you can work on that hatred to try to mitigate it so that you can make it less intense. So it's actually possible to have a seeing that's much wider than material seeing. And Ustad Rahmatullah Ali is a seer 
of things that are much wider than material things. And whatever it is he sees in these domains, and some of them are very strange barzakhi domains, what he calls the barzakh, the in-between, in which you can actually walk around domains that are not just normal domains. The sheikh simply writes down what he sees. He has a notebook and he's writing his observations. And if you look at his handwriting and the scraps of paper that on which whatever he could find, he would write down whatever is passing through his heart and mind and soul, he would write it down. So he's saying, you have to understand, I do not manipulate that which passes through my heart and mind in order to explicate them. Why? عَزًّا مِنَ التَّحْرِيرِ أَوْ خَوْفًا مِنَ التَّغْيِيرِ فَأَكْتُبَهَا كَمَا سَلَحَتْ Why? Because I am too incapacitated, too incapacitated to explicate it. Okay? I am too... عجز عجز is a very important word in Rasail al-Nur. It means incapacity. And this is from which you get i'jaz. I'jaz al-Qur'an. As in Kitab al-Baqillani and, and the others. What is i'jaz? Al-i'jaz is when you're so stunned, you're incapacitated. It's like you've been zapped with, with one of those electrical, uh, electrical shocks or uh, what do they call it? Uh, Taser, 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 yeah. So you're zapped through this and you're incapacitated, okay? This is ajz, you cannot move, okay? So he's saying, ajzan an tahrir. It's because I'm not able to actually explicate and unpack what I am seeing, okay? And this is why I don't touch it. I just write it as it comes. Aw khawfan min at tagheer or because I am fearful of alteration or changing, meaning writing down something that I did not see. So he is trying to be as honest and accurate in what he records as he can. And because of that, he's often writing them in, in forms that are difficult to understand. It's a beautiful passage. So now notice the Sheikh is saying, yes, I acknowledge that People are saying they don't understand. And some people say that my books will never be understood. And they say, no, no. There will come a time where thinking believers will understand. Why? Because they will maybe share injuries that my generation is not sharing as much. And sharing my injuries will make you understand my medicines. And because I am recording, simply recording that which comes to me, I cannot change it. I don't want to change it because I am too incapacitated to do so. I'm stunned by, by, by what I see. I simply write it down, okay, without unpacking it. And also because I don't want to manipulate them or change them in any way. So, And this is why I write them as they come. So we finished one paragraph. <laughs> Or one paragraph finished us. وَأَيْضًا أَتَكَلَّمُ فِي مَكَانِي This is a very strange but very important passage. وَأَيْضًا أَتَكَلَّمُ فِي مَكَانِي I speak from my place. I am in a particular place and I speak from my place. لَا فِي مَقَامِ السَّامِعِ الْمُوَاجِهِ I am not speaking in the maqam or the state or the place of the listener who is facing me. Okay? So I am not basically writing to a, a reader. Notice أتكلم في مكاني I speak in my place. لا في مقام السامع المواجه لي Not in the state or the stature or the place of the hearer who is facing me. خلافا لسائر المتكلمين This is different from most speakers. When, when I speak, I am speaking to you now. I have you in mind. I am addressing you. 
And when you speak to me, you're addressing me. So the Shaykh is saying, I'm not addressing, I'm not addressing the hearer. I'm not actually addressing you, okay. which is very strange. It's like you're writing and you're not addressing us. So how are you addressing? It says, I speak from my place. Not in the maqam or the place of the hearer who is facing me. This is different from the case of most speakers. Who suppose themselves or put themselves in the place of the hearer. So that when they speak, they take the hearer into account. Okay? This is what most speakers do. When you speak to the other, you imagine yourself to be in his place or her place so that you are addressing that person. So the result of this is that my book, which I write not for you, but for me, when you are reading it, it looks like a book which is flipped in a mirror. So it's very difficult for you to understand it or to read it. Meaning, because you're not the addressee, you're not the one I'm addressing with my book, I'm addressing it to myself. So when you're reading it, you're actually seeing it reversed. And this is why you're having difficulties understanding me. What does this mean? It's like trying to read the book in the mirror. It's reversed. Okay? So what's the, what's the solution? How do we solve this problem? The Sheikh suggests something very strange. He says, Since I'm not going to his place, to his state, to his um, uh, status, because I'm not going to the reader like that, why doesn't the reader send me my, my send me his imagination? So he's asking the reader, rather than to be to expect to be addressed by him, to actually instead send his imagination. Give me your imagination, he's telling to the doctor. And he's saying, I will take this imagination. I will consider this imagination a guest, musafir, as you say in Turkish. I will consider this imagination of yours a guest. Where, where will, where will I, where will I, where will the uh, Ustad put this guest? He says, I will put this guest, the reader, ala aynay, on top of my eyes, fi rasi, in my inside my head. Why? Kayara kama ara. So that he say, uh, sees as I see. Meaning, I, it's a very, this is page 222. Two, two. You can read it in the Turkish, you can read it, but it's an amazing, it's an amazing, amazing passage. He's basically saying, when I'm writing, I'll, we will go through the ideas from the beginning. He's saying, when I'm writing, many people will not understand. But there will come a time where people will understand. Mm -hmm. And this is because my topics are actually addressed to particular ailments. And whoever doesn't share these ailments will not understand. So people who haven't been bitten by these snakes will not be able to understand the value of the of the uh, antidote yeah. and he says because what i write is simply a record of what i see i don't touch it i don't try to change it why because i'm too incapacitated to unpack it and i'm also worried or afraid of altering things on top of all this as i write i'm not putting myself in the place of the reader but I'm addressing myself. So when the reader reads what I'm writing, he actually, it's as if he sees my book in reverse, in a mirror. So he cannot understand it. For him to understand it, 
let him come to me and I will host him inside my head on top of my eyes so that he sees as I see Kayara kama ara so that he sees what I see Kayara kama ara and this is a key phrase so that he sees as I see so we were saying that Ustad Badi' Zaman Nursi Badi' Zaman Nursi is a seer and he wants you to see things so if you try to see things by yourself you will be seeing them as you see things if you want to see things that he sees and that's the only way you can understand what he's writing is to actually start to see the world as he sees it okay? and he's giving you an invitation he's saying you marhaba you you come in into my head on top of my eyes and see what I see. So yes, subhanAllah, you say, how can this be? Okay? There is a field of philosophy which is called hermeneutics, which is the theory of interpretation. And this problem of understanding the world as someone else understand, understands it was discussed at length. And there was something in the 1920s and 30s which was called the theory of reenactment, which means for you to understand what an author is writing, you need to reenact the thought that he was thinking. This theory became discredited in later years, especially after the 19, 1960s with Hans Georg Gadamer and all these uh, postmodernist tendencies and so on, and they became to doubt this. However, even in the West, there are still thinkers like Emilio Betti who wrote in the, in the 60s and Eric D. Hirsch who wrote in the 70s and 80s who still think that the key to understanding is putting yourself in the author's place. Putting yourself somehow with empathy, with sympathy, with uh, empath em uh, empathic or, or, or uh, congenial thinking and sympathetic thinking in a, putting yourself in a position where you can see the world as the author who wrote the book sees it. Okay? But there is something about this hermeneutics which is plus plus, meaning this is more than Emilio Betti or, or Eric Hirsch. What I'm trying to say, why I'm mentioning these theories, is that some wise guy hearing us from Germany, for example, will say, yeah, yeah, but Hans Georg Gadamer did away with the theory of reenactment long ago, okay? Well, we have keys to reenactment that a, a normal cognitively oriented Western educated person may not have. We have the key of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which we can call Al-Ma'iyya bil mahabba One of the Sahaba asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about togetherness and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied Al-Mar'u ma'a man ahab Each person is with whomever he loves Allah marzuqna mahabbat al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warzuqna ma'iyyatahu which means that love okay, can actually give you a kind of togetherness which is concrete and real. Okay? So if you want to reenact the thinking of an author, to put it in Western philosophical terms, the key is not cognitive. Yes, imagination may help. So you can imagine yourself to be in that position. Reading the history of that author and the history of his circumstances and his period may help you. But the most important key to understanding another is love. This is why someone who doesn't love an author and does not respect the author and does not have adab or proper manner with the author can never have access to the inner thoughts of the author. And this is why our mashayikh, rahmatullahi alayhim, uh, and uh, for those living Hafidhahumullah in the madrasa the traditional way of teaching before they teach you knowledge they teach you adab first 
So if you come with the bad attitude towards the teacher, towards the book that you're reading, you'll never get anything out of it. And this is why we started by reading the Fatiha on the soul of the author. Okay? And we express love for him. Why? Because that expression of love and that Fatiha that you read and the Malaika says Ameen, okay? And the Barzakh opens up. There is a Ma'iyya. There is a, a togetherness, a spiritual togetherness in the world of souls that actually gives you disclosures that would not be possible with mere thinking or cognition or smart guy mentality. Okay. So this is a, a key. The Shaykh is telling you, really he's telling you in this passage, <coughs> Rahmatullah alayhi, he's actually extending to every single one of us. Notice how beautiful this is. He's like writing this in 1922. Okay. 1922. He says, Ya Ahmed. You have an open invitation to where? To the madrasa? To Der Shkhana? No. You have an invitation to his head. Not only his head, he's telling you you have an invitation to his eyes. You know what that means? He's telling you, come and sit inside my eyes so that you can see what I see. You can never achieve this. You can never reply to this invitation and respond and make benefit from this invitation if you don't love him. Because it is the, the spaceship that takes you there is Mahabba. And this is not me talking or Badi'a Zaman Nursi talking. This is Rasulullah Al-Mar'u ma'a man ahab. Al-Mar'u ma'a man ahab. And this is, there is another type of ma'iyya which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches, which is very important. And that is the ma'iyya of the sinful who sit with the righteous, who get accepted not because of them, but of, because of whom they sat with. The free riders. Yeah. So. Because this man was walking and he saw these people who were sitting, studying and doing dhikrullah, reciting Quran, reciting hadith. They were like righteous, good people. And this very miserable man, you know, very faulty and, and sinful, came and he sat at the edge of the carpet, maybe thinking, I don't want to pollute the carpet, I'm so bad, you know. But he sat with the salihin. So the Malaika had a uh, hard time, you know. They said well, with the CD, we know, like he's a good guy, Ahmad, great guy. You know? But what, 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 what are we going to do with this man, you know? And the Mawla Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal, in his infinite mercy, says, accept him also. Ula'ika al qawm because these people, la yashqa jalisuhum bihim. Whoever sits with them cannot go wrong. So, I give you these two advices, and they are golden advices of Rasulullah Sallallahu If you want access to what is good in the books of the Ummah, not only in, in, in Badi' al-Zaman's writings and Rasail al-Nur, but if you want to understand Imam Ghazali, Juwayni, Baqillani, Ash'ari, Maturidi, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, if you want to understand any of these great figures, Ibn Atallah Sikandari, Sayyid Abdul Qadir Jailani, Sayyid Ahmad al Rifai, Sayyid Ahmad al Badawi, Sayyid Ibrahim al Sufi, Sayyid Mawlana Jalal al Din al Rumi, Sayyid Ahmad Sir Hindi Mujaddidi. If you want to understand any of these people, there are two keys. Love them and express your love for them by praying for them, by reading the Fawatih for them. And the second thing, sit with them with the niya that despite your shortcomings and your messed up mentality and your messed up life and all the, the repetitive sinfulness that you practice, that you're coming with the hope that you'll be accepted because of them. You can even do this in a mosque. You can say, Allah, I know for a fact that I am the lousiest, worst person coming to this mosque. But because of these people, this Bangladeshi guy coming, 
and this guy from Kerala driving the cab, and this guy from uh, Kashmir, and this guy from uh, America, and this guy, please accept me fil with them. Okay? These two are important keys. This hermeneutics is not in Emilio Betti or, or Eric D. Hirsch or any of these, or Wilhelm Delta. Or, this hermeneutics, they used to know it. In the 16th century, they spoke about spiritual things. Unfortunately, they lost this. This is the hermeneutics you need for, for Usta. So he's saying, Ya Ahmed, here is an open invitation. Okay? Come into my head, come into my eyes. I put you on my eyes. You know, like these uh, people from Sham, they have these beautiful expressions. Even the Egyptians say, Min inayya, from my eyes, you know? Min ayuni, you know? It's a beautiful, the eyes are very, very valuable things. So he's actually giving you an invitation into his eyes so that you can see what he sees. This, if you want to call it phenomenology, this is co-phenomenology, co-seeing. He wants you to see what he sees. Okay? And the way you answer this invitation is by loving him and reading the Fatiha for his soul and all the souls of the people that I mentioned that I didn't mention, all the books in the... This is a trick you can use. You can say we do a Fatiha for all the books of the old Tarajim of all the ulama of Ahl al-Qibla, Fatiha. So he's saying, the reason my writings are difficult is because they are medicines to injuries that you may not share, but who will be shared by later people. Because I am actually writing whatever I see, feeling incapacitated to explicate them and worried about changing them. And the fact that I am writing from my place without reverence for your place, but I want you to come to my place and get into my eyes and see what I see. And because of all this, Adrajtu, so I have written or I have put down, fi, and then he mentions the names of the letters from which this book is composed. And the names are very interesting. One risala or epistle or, or chapter is called Nukta, point. Okay. Nukta. And the other one is Qatra, droplet. Okay. And the other one, Wadayliha, yani a droplet and its tail. Wadarra, atom. Washamma. It's not, a, not, it's not a smell, it's a sniff. One sniff. Just a shamma. Wahabba. Like a little seed, you know. Why is he saying? Why is he naming his letters like this? They're all tiny things. It's because he's actually observing and he's seeing these little things and he's amazingly seeing that each thing contains a universe of things. As he says in other places in the, in the Matnawi, where the eye of the mosquito can contain the sun. You know, sometimes you see these little flies sitting in the sun, going like this, cleaning their eyes and, you know, with their little hands. And that, that eye, that complex eye of the fly, contains the sun. It's as if the sun is there only for that little fly. You know, sometimes I see these weird birds here in Dubai that are not actually native to this place. And they come and they, like in a, in a garden of a huge mow or a or a DIFC or like, and this little bird comes and takes from this water that's dripping from a pipe made from PVC, made in an injection molding machine or extrusion machine from Germany, from plastics that came from China. <laughs> yes, and those Chinese plastics were made from oil that was imported from Saudi, okay. And then, the, and then the concrete that was uh, uh, from stones in, in Ras al Khaimah, crushed in crushers from, uh, from Italy, and, and, then, and then mixed by Indian uh, workers with, with the engineers from... And then all of this 
And they say, subhanAllah, maybe all of this was only for that little bird so that it will have its water, you know? In that moment, in that moment in cosmic history, that little bird is the king of kings. He is the, like, the master of all, the, all of these humans were working so hard to give him his water, you know? So all the investments, all the companies, all this stuff, they're all working for him, you know? So the little things in life, and notice I, I love these names, you know, of these letters. Subhanallah. Nukta, uh, point, qatra, droplet, darra, atom, sniff, habba. Okay? He says, I put in these things, in each one of these things, tafariq, hadsiyat, waqit'at, mir'at. The Arabic is weird. Huh? This is not common Arabic. And uh, some Arabs arrogant, they think that he's making grammatical mistakes. So Ihsan Abi, Ihsan Qasim, went and checked these strange expressions and he found that they're all correct from a grammatical point of view, from a linguistic point of view. It's just that some phrases, the Arabs have forgotten how to use, okay? But because of his study of grammar and, and uh, the linguistic sciences, so it's hard to find a mistake, really. I and mean, he's not perfect, but nobody is perfect except Rusul. Um, okay, so he's saying, Tafariq Hadsiyat, Waqit'at Mir'at. What's Tafariq Hadsiyat? Hads is like a sensibility in English, okay? It's like a, what, what uh, Charles Sanders Pierce, the American philosopher, calls abduction. It's when you you get an immediate knowledge of something without deduction, you're not deducing it, mm -hmm. and without induction. So you're not saying this swan is white and this swan is white and this swan is white, therefore all swans are white or most swans are white. Mm -hmm. This is induction. If you say all humans are mortal and Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, that's deduction. Right. Abduction is not this, not that. Mm -hmm. It's like, bam, you get, you, you, there is an immediate hats. Like you, it's like intuition. Ilham is more like something that comes to you. It's like a, it's like a man, which means dispersed intuitions. So he's basically saying, look, what did I put in these little droplets and these points? I've put in there dispersed groups of intuitions. So meaning as he was walking and he's observing, he's getting hit by these intuitions. He's taken these scatterings of intuitions, okay? Tafariq, like they're scattered, and he's put them into these points, okay? Tamam? Waqit'at mir'at, and the fragments of mirrors. So imagine you have a mirror, and this mirror gets shattered into a thousand pieces. And you take the pieces of the mirror, and you put them in these points. You know those in, in, uh, in uh, they sell them for birthday parties and so on, this, these uh, bags of, uh, of, uh, of shimmering and yeah. shiny little pieces, okay? So it's, it's like that. A thousand little mirrors, okay? And he's taking these and he's putting them into these points. So he's saying, I'm walking around, I'm getting hit by these multiple intuitions, and I have all these fragments of pieces of mirrors, so I'm saving them for you in these points that I'm making, okay? Why? Because maybe with God's permission, with Allah's permission, there will come someone who will put them together, all these little pieces. <coughs> How? بِتَحْرِيرٍ وَتَصْوِيرٍ through articulation and through imaging. And that way a mirror will appear because from the fragments of mirrors. In which there will appear in this mirror that you're constituting together. Veracity as such. Truth as such. The real as such. You know, yaqeen is a, an incredible word. 
because it means at the same time, it means certainty, it means truth, the real, the sure, it has all that, and it even means death, because death is certain. <laughs> so, Ayn al Yaqeen, not Yaqeen only, Ayn al Yaqeen, the, the very, can you say Ayn? It's like in, in Turkish you have this Ayn. Like it's this, it's the same. Ain, it's the, it's the same. Ain, it's like the, it's it's beyond the real thing. It's like the thing, you know, itself, the itselfness of it. Okay, that's the ain. Ain the yani, it's certitude as such. Okay, this certitude as such will appear in a mirror which is constituted by little fragments that he's dispersed in these points in his Rasail al -Nur. So he's basically saying, be patient with the fragmentation because it will eventually make sense and it will come together. And when you're reading Rasail al -Nur, sometimes you take the bus and you take the metro and you go to the madrasa and it's very cold and it's raining and you sit for one hour and you don't really get much. You're tired and you're falling asleep even as the guy is reading. And you don't get much, and, and sometimes you get the feeling, this is all fragmented, what am I doing with all this? But be patient. With time, it all falls together, and then you get a mirror, and in this mirror, you will see certitude as such. Okay. And then you will get an interview, like, you will get, you will actually receive an intuition Yuzhiru minhu, from which shines forth Noor Haqq al -yaqin. From which you will get the Noor of Haqq al -yaqin, the truth of certitude. Kayfa la? Why not? Why, why doesn't this happen? How, how can not, this not happen? This is a definitive promise. Wa huwa faydhu al-Qur'an al Because all of this that you're seeing, that you that he's trying to point out, down, uh, point uh, down, or uh, sorry, note down, is actually the from from the Quran, the mubin, the the, the 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 clear Quran that has what in Latin they call claritas, like a like sheer clarity, okay, emanating from the Quran, is at the basis of all that is being said. And then he concludes with a prayer, and we follow him in this prayer. He says, Allahumma, arina al haqqa haqqa, warzuqna tiba'a. Show us the truth for what it is. Show us the truth as truth. Warzuqna tiba'a. And give to us following that truth. Wa arina al batila batila. And show us that which is false as false. Warzuqna ishtinaba. And give to us avoiding it. Amen. Now, in this world, what they call post truth with fake, yes. basically telling, telling you, show us the authentic as authentic, and show us the fake oh. as fake. This is a beautiful prayer, you know? نقول على هذا أمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وعلى جميع الصالحين والمشايخ ومشايخنا العالمين العاملين وعلى ومنهم وفيهم وبهم سيدي أستاذ بديع الزمان نورسي رحمة الله عليه يقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ولكافر المسلمين الفاتحة